All right, everyone, we are here at Small Data SF, and I'm super excited to be with David Yef, uh, CEO of Story. Uh, David, welcome to The Robert Show. It's, I don't think it's your debut. I know we did a show earlier, long back, a few years back, uh, and I've seen all the great growth that Story has done. Uh, but just for audience, would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Tell us more about what Story does, what's your role, and what's new? Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. It's, it's good to talk again. I think it's sure. been like three years or something. But I know, right? I'm, I'm Dave, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Estuary. So we are what we call the right time data platform. And what that means is we are a data integration platform, but we work with both streaming and batch data, however the customer wants to use it. For analytics use cases, most customers don't really need streaming. Um, right. But for operational use cases, where like you're updating a dashboard, or something like that, creating a data product or doing AI even, yep. You, yep. you might want more of a real-time uh, use case. So that's that's what we do. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Dave, thanks for sharing that. Uh, also, uh, from the conversations and obviously the content that you all have been sharing, you've pushed back on the idea that real-time data infrastructure is a hard problem for the future. So kind of wanting to know what's changed in the last few years that makes streaming more viable of what it was maybe five years ago. Well, I think the unit economics of streaming work better than batch, right? Like the fact that you're always incrementally processing data, they they make it so that it's obvious to use it, right? Like it can yeah. be a, w a fraction of the cost of batch, and because of that, it's gotten a, one of the reasons that it's got lots of attention recently is that. Um, but there's also a lot of platforms that have made the operational part of it much simpler. So, yes. you know, for for instance, Confluent has made Kafka a lot easier to use, and you have. Pulsar and companies around that, Stream Native that is help, helping with that type of thing. Exactly. Um, and we do the same thing. We try to even take it to that next level of simplicity. So it can look a little bit more like an ELT platform mm -hmm. and a little less like this really operational thing that you have to manage and understand what your streaming system's actually doing under the hood. Um, so that's, that's our goal. And I think that we're just going to see more and more of that. Yeah, uh, that, those are fantastic insights. Uh, Dave, I'm kind of also curious to know from a user perspective, when you are talking to a user who's running batch pipeline today, what questions do you ask to determine whether they actually need a real-time or, uh, you know, real-time streaming or uh, they are better off staying with a batch? How does that kind of uh, differentiation happen? We end up having having a lot of customers who start off working with us in a batch processing context. Right? It's, it's kind of weird. Um, and so I would say more than 50% of our customers come to us with batch data processing problems. Right. Um, and they usually graduate eventually to like mm -hmm. having some application or use case that actually requires streaming. Right. Um, sometimes it's the other way around. Other but way around. Right. the questions that I would ask are like, what are you doing? <laughs> Is this an analytics use case where someone's looking at a dashboard? You probably don't need streaming data for that. Um, and you know, that's the biggest one. The second one is actually streaming can be, um, depending on where you're pushing it to, mm. it can require post-processing to be able to take your audit log of every change event and turn it into yep. a fact table that has all of the rolled up data, rolled up on your primary keys or dimensions. Right. Um, so even for, um, even for customers who do have a very low latency use case, a lot of the time, we will do micro batch processing to do updates on their primary key that are actually merge queries um, for that use case. So even even for like very low latency use cases, it might not make sense to do true streaming. Usually, true streaming is like, you know, I have millisecond latency needs. Yeah, uh, that's uh, really good uh, in terms of the uh, you know obviously understanding how enterprise leaders kind of think, and you know sometimes it's also where they need to be educated about a few things in terms of how they should be using maybe real-time streaming or sitting back uh, and doing the batch, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm kind of also wanting to know a little bit about the architectural, right? Uh, so what uh, kind of uh, other architectural changes get considered when a user migrates from batch uh, to streaming? Yeah, there's, the answer is actually not that much. Uh, mm, and that's, okay. that's the goal, right? Okay. Like, Interesting. Um, one thing that we do that's very different than batch systems is that we disintermediate the source and the destination. Okay. And okay. so the reason that we do that is um, partially because it helps with reliability, right? If your destination is down, you can still be extracting data from the source. Mm. And in, in the case of talking about like databases for 
um, CDC use cases, if I have a Postgres database, I always want to be extracting data from it. Exactly. Because right. then your wall isn't filling up. So mm -hmm. it's important. That's one of the reasons we do it. So that's an architectural shift. Uh, it's not one that they have to care about too much, except that we give them the capability to uh, connect their own cloud storage as an intermediary layer to have that overflow come in. It's just more like a promotion for them itself, eh? yeah. while using the same sort of architecture, not changing a lot. Uh, yeah, that can connect to cloud storage bucket, and that allows them to then have an intermediary place right, for the data right. to flow if their destination's down. And it also lets us be a one-to-many system. So we can, you can capture data from one source today, um, like maybe Snow, uh, for, from Postgres and push it to Snowflake. Yep. And then if someone here at the Mother Duck conference wants to be trying out Mother Duck, they can go and do that with their same pipeline without having to recapture it from the source. Mm, that's fantastic. Uh, just wanting to know a little bit about, since we are here at the small data SF, uh, uh, how does Estuary and Mother Duck uh, partnership look like? Uh, What's the relationship uh, kind of wanting to know? Yeah, well, we, we love the folks at Mother Duck. They've yeah. been um, great partners. And so we've partnered on integrations, obviously helping com customers who have data um, try to get it from their source. Um, right. like Postgres is a very common one. A lot of people who are using Postgres for <laughs> analytics want to use Mother Duck. Yes. Um, so we'll help them get it from their source to yep. Mother Duck in, in real time or in you know scheduled latency. Yep. Um, but in addition, you know, we have hundreds of sources, so they can choose other ones as well. Exactly, I oh, love that. Uh, also, you've spoken a lot about you know change data capture. For someone implementing CDC for the first time, what's the most common mistake uh, that causes problems down the line? Uh, do you have any thoughts around that? Because uh, I know you talk to a lot of data engineers, you talk to a lot of uh, streaming folks out there, so yeah. The biggest problem is um, that we see is, uh, is I'll just jump to the punchline and then say what yeah. the mistake was For that sure. got there. So usually it's that the database can fall behind and you'll actually have um, data from that CDC slot in Postgres, it's the right ahead log, fill up and cause production issues. And so that's mm. a major issue. You don't want that to happen. Yeah. And so that can be caused by maybe your reader that's reading CDC isn't fast enough to keep up with it, right. or the reader goes down and you didn't notice it. Um, and there's a lot of ways to get around this, but the <laughs> easiest one that I can just quickly say now is set like a Postgres has a concept that lets you say, get rid of the replication slot if it goes above a certain size. And a lot of people don't set that. Yeah. So, just set that and you'll be a lot happier. That's amazing, Dave. Uh, one last question for you is for those enterprise leaders, those data streaming folks, any advice that you would want to give them uh, while moving from batch to, you know, obviously uh, real-time streaming as well? Yeah, I'd say don't try to do it all at once. <laughs> you know, we see a lot of cus customers that just, instead of trying to take a small use case that really benefits by that change, they try to boil the ocean, yep. and that's probably the thing to avoid. Just pick one. One step at a time. And right? show your business leader's value. Value. Right? Like show the business leader's value in one use case, and then expand from there. Love it. Uh, Dave, uh, such great conversation, such great insights. Thanks for doing this. Uh, I hope you have a fantastic conference ahead. All the best to a story. I am seeing all the great growth. Uh, congratulations on the recent funding as well. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, we just announced, I think, two weeks ago, our Series A funding led by M13. Love it. Uh, great going, and uh, we'll keep the conversation going. Looking uh, for a 2.0 session very soon. But Dave, uh, thanks again for doing this. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.